All right. So in First Peter chapter two, uh, we what we had done is we had gone through, we breezed through these last three verses, uh, and as I said uh, just a little second ago, Isaiah fifty three is quoted quite a li- quite a little bit through this. And so we're going to break down these three verses a little bit. We're going to do quite a bit of flipping, um, but mostly back and forth between Isaiah 53. All right, so we'll read down through these three verses here first, starting in verse 23. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth right, judgeth righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And those last two uh, words there, shepherd and bishop, we're going to be um, expounding on those quite a bit tonight and looking at those things as well. And so, uh, 22 says, Who did no sin, neither was there guile found in his mouth, who when he is reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. We're going to look at that suffering just for a second over in uh, 1 Peter 3.18. If you want to look over there, it should be maybe even just on the same page. It says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. I want to be very clear that that is by the Spirit and not in the Spirit. Uh, Because there are those who would uh, claim that Jesus' resurrection was only a spiritual resurrection, not a bodily resurrection. But he was resurrected physically and bodily from the grave. And his physical body, his flesh that he walked this earth with, is now seated in the heavenly places right next to the Father. And so that is is his place, that is his rightful place, and that is where his body is sitting. So it's not uh, quickened in the flesh, but quickened by the flesh. Uh, verse 21 in chapter 2 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. All right, we are going to be seeing in verse 21, once we get through 22, 23, 24, and 25, verse 21 can jump right to chapter 3, verse 1. Okay, because we have a likewise at this place. All right, so when we get into chapter 3, verse 1, we're going to look at those things. Uh, but that's, that's the type of thing that you want to be on the lookout in your own Bible study, is when you're reading down through and you see something like likewise. All right, likewise means that there has to be something before that it's comparing it to. And so it says, likewise, ye wives be subject unto your own husbands. All right, so we're looking at a subjection. All right, so in like manner, likewise, there has to be some subjection. And, you know, we see that in verse 21. And so we're, we'll look at that when we get there. But turn to Isaiah 53 now. Isaiah chapter 53. And we see, we see a lot of this uh, quoted uh, basically by Peter here. Um, Isaiah 53, 9 says, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Now, verse 22 in in 1 Peter 2 says, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. All right, so he's he's practically quoting Isaiah 53 here. Uh, Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. These are very familiar uh, messianic verses on on the Messiah, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in chapter 23, we have this this same basic thing. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Uh, I want to I want to look at that for just a second, but I want to read uh, chapter 53 all the way through. It's just it's just these 12 verses here. And so follow along with this. And then we're going to go back into first Peter and, and look at a couple of things. Uh, It says in chapter 53 of Isaiah, verse 1, Who hath believed our report, and and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Uh, time really doesn't permit us tonight. Uh, maybe at the end, if we've got a little bit of time, we'll jump back into this. But the Lord showed me some things out of this in verse 5, uh, relating into Leviticus chapter 4, about the peace offering. Uh, and if we have time, we'll, we'll dive into that here later on. Uh, but just, just keep that in the back of your minds. Uh, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the, these two words all in here, they encompass everyone. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. All right. It's not just a select few. It's not just a select uh group of people that God laid the iniquity for those people on Jesus Christ and did not lay the iniquity of others on Jesus Christ. It was for all of mankind. It was for everyone. And so that is a, another uh, conclusion that we can make here. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Uh, he was oppressed and was afflicted, he opened, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich his death, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall pro prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Of course, that, that soul that was made an offering for sin, uh, as, as we mentioned last night at prayer meeting, dealing with Abraham, and uh, he told Isaac that the Lord will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. That burnt offering was Jesus' soul related in that thing, uh, that his soul would not be left in hell. Okay? And here in this, in this instance here, his soul was an offering for sin. It was made that burnt offering. Um, I would like to pause here just for a second and turn to Leviticus chapter 6. As long as we're mentioning this and it's, it's fresh on my mind, I'd like to look at this really quick. Leviticus 6, and we're going to look at verse 28. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. All right, thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Here in this, in this instance here, um, uh, actually, you know what? Let's back up. Let's look at verse 25. Verse 25 it says, Speak unto Aaron and to his son, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest that offereth it for sin shall eat it. The whole, in the holy place shall it be eaten in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation. Whatsoever shall touch the flesh thereof shall be holy. And when there is sprinkled the blood thereof upon any garment, thou shalt wash that whereupon it was sprinkled in the holy place. All right, so this is, he's relating the blood of that sin offering as being most holy. But the earthen vessel wherein it is sodden shall be broken. And if it be sodden in a brazen pot, it shall be both scoured and rinsed in water. Here we see that broke that earthen vessel that carried the sin offering. The sin offering from the place where it was killed and separated out into the place where it was going to be eaten. That is that, that, that thing here, that earthen vessel. And that thing wherein it was sodden, it was to be broken, never to be used again. That same case is with Jesus' earthen vessel that carried the sin offering. His sin offering was his soul. It said that in, in Isaiah 53.10, thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. All right, what carries around the soul and the spirit? It's your, it's your flesh, it's your earthen vessel. And that earthen vessel was broken on the cross for us. It was, it was, uh, he was that veil was rent, the veil of his flesh was rent, never to be used again 
other than to rule and to reign. Okay, uh, and so there there is that that correlation between that uh, that sin offering and his soul being made an offering for sin and his uh, earthen vessel and such. All right, uh, back in Isaiah fifty three, uh, picking up in verse eleven. It says, he shall see the travail of his soul and be, shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And of course, this is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every, every bit of this, you can relate to his life, to his death, uh, to his sacrifice, to the, the offering of his soul, uh, to his work on the cross and, and uh, in the justifying of, uh, in the resurrection from the dead, because it's by the faith of Christ that we are justified. All right. And we see here, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities by his knowledge, it says. Shall my servant justify many? And so that is when we receive that faith of Christ and we have that knowledge of him that we are able to believe on him. Okay, that is that is the uh, I, I guess the word mechanics would work. The mechanics of how salvation is applied to a person. All right. Uh, now, uh, let's go back over into first Peter now. Keep your, keep your place there on Isaiah. I should have said that before I had you close. <laughs> Sorry. All right, we'll read verse 23 again. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges, judgeth righteously. You remember that before the sheep, uh, before, uh, as a sheep before the shearers is dumb, he opened not his mouth, and, and here is the same thing. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he, was, when he suffered, he threatened not, all right? Uh, if, if we want to really water this, not even water it down, just like get it way down low on the bottom shelf, uh, this is the type of attitude that we ought to have, okay? If, if I could make a, a, a spiritual application to our own lives, uh, as Jesus Christ is our ensample, as we look to him, as we look to his life, as we look to his death, uh, we see that, uh, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. I think of uh, Romans twelve seventeen, uh, recompense to uh, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, with as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Mm -hmm. Right, and and so this is that was seventeen and eighteen, and so this is the same thing that he was living out when he suffered. He threatened not. How often do when things are going well and when we're not hurting, we can be just nice as punch. But when we're in pain or when we're tired or when, you know, we've had a bad day and we're, we're under some suffering, uh, maybe things are extremely stressful, uh, we can be very short fused. And, and this is just another example uh, as to when we look to the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to be looking at his pattern of life. All right. When he was suffering, he threatened not. He didn't have a, a recompense on those people. Uh, his heart was broken for them, okay? Uh, remembering that, that, and honestly, the only way you can do that is with the mind of Christ. Your carnal mind can't be subject to the law of God in that way, all right? You've got to be walking in the spirit in order for that. And a, a good way to know if you're, if you're walking in your carnal mind, being driven by your needs, or if you're walking by the spirit, being driven by Jesus Christ, is when you are suffering, when you are tired, when you are weary, when you are uh, under great distress, how do you react to people? You know, what's your, what's your immediate reaction? Um, so these are, again, things that we need to uh, be examining in our own lives, be looking at. Uh, but we'll continue on here. Um, I would like to look at uh, this word committed, all right? Because there, there's another couple of things I'd like to point out about this. Um, Psalm 51 and Luke 20, or Psalm 31. Yes, Psalm 31. My writing is so small in there, I could barely read it. All right, Psalm 31 is where we need to go right now. We're going to look at verse 5. Remembering the verse in Luke 23 where uh, he says, uh, In Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. 
Okay, let's look at Psalm 31, 5. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Uh, this is another of the messianic psalms. This is one that you might not uh, commonly hear of. Uh, I believe Brother McVeigh in his podcast has gone through this. Um, I remember him talking about, where was it? Um, Oh, here it is in verse 12. Look at this here. Uh, speaking of that broken vessel we were talking about, I am forgotten as a dead man out of mind. I am like a broken vessel. All right, you see, that is why God promised to preserve his words. All right, that is why the King James Bible is something precious and something unique because it's literally the only Bible in its own language that you can follow out the words and find doctrine. Okay, you can't do this with a NASB. You can't do this with an NIV. You can't do it with an ESV. Uh, you can't do it with any of the modern versions, including the New King James. There's so much that's convoluted in there. You cannot do this. All right, things are just switched around so much. Um, and then yet we even have people in our circles that will say, well, we need to figure out what the Greek and the Hebrew said so we really know what the word meant. No, the person that translated it from those ancient languages into your language knew those languages better than Larkin did better than uh, James Strong does, did, and better than any scholar that's out there today knows, okay? Beyond that, they were led by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost told these men to use these particular words in interpreting those out of the original languages into the King James Bible. And so when we see things like broken vessel, hey, I know that because of Leviticus 6. And I know that his body was broken. He said, here, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. All right? Uh, we, we find these, these themes throughout, and we can find, that is how we find the Lord Jesus Christ on every single page of the Bible. All right? Um, so, uh, but looking at that uh, there in verse 5, into thine hand I commend my spirit. I also want you to go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Let's drive that one written down here. Huh, I do not. How about that? All right. But Acts 7 and 59. This is, of course, at the, the stoning of Stephen. And what we're looking at is a, a, a comparison of the two. But there's a couple of doctrinal things I want to bring out of this verse. All right. Um, let's start at verse 58. All right. Uh, and cast him out of the city. And stoned him. This is talking of Stephen. He had, he had preached that great message. And, and uh, it says when they'd heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They took him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of similarities in Stephen's death, in the wording of the things he says at his death, and in the death of Jesus Christ. All right, um, He says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, commending his spirit unto the Lord, committing his spirit unto the Lord, as we saw in Psalm uh, 31.5. Uh, but also, we need to look at verse 59. It says, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God. Now, was that the people that stoned him that were calling upon God? No, what this is saying is Stephen was calling upon God at the moment they were stoning him, okay? And saying, and this is how he was calling upon God, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now, if we take Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If we take that to mean everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord at that very moment, they are born again. That would mean that Stephen was not born again until this moment. Would it not? Because he's saying he was calling upon God. He was calling upon the Lord Jesus. He was saying, receive my spirit. The common teaching of Romans 10, 13 is that Romans 10, 13 is the last tipping point to get into heaven. Once you understand you're a sinner and you know you don't want to go to hell and you believe Jesus died and rose from the dead and you believe he's the son of God, all you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Verse 14 is there for a reason. All right. 
Stephen was not calling upon God for salvation for his, his immortal soul. What he was doing was he was practicing the true doctrinal um, explanation of what calling upon the name of the Lord is, is he was living a life of calling upon the name of the Lord. Remembering that all the way back in the Old Testament, you see Abraham calling upon the name of the Lord. You see um, there the, uh, the descendants of Seth. Uh, and I think it was, it wasn't Enos. Who was it? I'm going to have to look there because now it's, it's really going to bother me. I think it's Genesis 4. Um, Seth, Abel, Enoch. It was Enos. All right. Genesis 4, 26. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. All right. At that time, people had gods even yet. All right. They had gods that they would call upon. And that is how people were identified. You weren't identified as American. You weren't identified as, as a Chinese or as a Canadian or a Mexican or whatever. You were identified by what God you called upon. Okay. Uh, these Bedouin tribes that were wandering the deserts, when a tribe would come up against another tribe and they would greet each other and they would say, what God do you call upon? Oh, we call upon Chemosh. What God do you call upon? Oh, we call upon the name of the Lord. Okay. That's how that would happen. All right. So what it is, is it's not a tipping point into salvation. What it is, is it's a lifestyle. It is a way of life, calling upon the name of the Lord. You call upon the name of the Lord from the beginning of the day until the end of the day. From the, the beginning of your life with walking with the Lord to the end of your life, which is what Stephen was doing here. He was not calling upon the name of the Lord for himself to be born again. But if we take Romans 10, 13 as being, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be born again. That's not what it says. It says saved. Saved doesn't always equal born again. Saved means rescued out of trouble. Rescued out of trial. Rescued out of a situation. Rescued out of whatever. In this instance, he was in great trouble. He was being stoned to death. He called on the name of the Lord Jesus and said, receive my spirit. He, he preached his last message. He preached as though he was a dead man, dead man preaching to dying men, as though he was never going to be able to preach again. And he didn't. And when he went out, he called upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, he said, lay not this into their charge. And he fell asleep. It doesn't say he died. It says he fell asleep. God just let him go to sleep. And so he called upon the name of the Lord and he was saved. But that's not when he was born again. All right. If, he, if that was when he was born again, he preached that entire message in his carnal flesh with the, Satan being his father. All right. Do you understand the problem with that? Stephen is one of those seven spirit filled men. So how could he be spirit filled if this is where he was born again? So calling on the name of the Lord does not mean that you are born again. Okay. That's, that's the main crux I wanted to get out of that. That just smacked me right in the middle of the eyes this morning as I was going over this. This is, with just a little bit of study and following out the doctrines and following out the wording in your Bible, you can find these things. So what is the point of calling on the name of the Lord? Well, once you have an established relationship with him, once you are born again, once God has brought you to that point where you are broken and where you are bruised and where you are filthy and a wretch and he saves you, then you are his child and you're born again. And then you can start calling on the name of the Lord. Okay, but it's not the calling on the name of the Lord that tips you over into salvation. I led 16 people through a prayer where they called on the name of the Lord. Not a single one of them's here tonight. Well, one of them is. And he's prayed three times and he's still not saved. Okay. This is the seriousness of this matter. This is the danger of this. I called upon the name of the Lord at least twice in my lifetime. Still lost. And so if a simple calling on the name of the Lord is what it takes for people to be saved. Why aren't people saved when they do it? Okay. It's because it's belief. It's not in the calling. It's in the belief. It is in the calling, but it's God's calling to salvation. All right? So, uh, let's go back into 1 Peter now.
And that was supposed to be the short verse for tonight. I did too. All right. Verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. All right. And there it is again. Isaiah 53, 5 talks about the stripes whereby we are healed. Um, let's look at. Yeah, we're going to examine this this thing of. Uh, bear our sins in his own body. Uh, we're going to look at that here. If we go to Isaiah, back to Isaiah 53, I should have left, left my thumb there. Okay. Now I've got a bookmark there. We're all set. All right, Isaiah 53 and verse 4 says, uh, Surely he hath borne our griefs, hath carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him, esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was, was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Uh, verse 11 says, we shall see of the travail of his soul, or he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. That's speaking of God the Father, looking at the travail of the soul of his son burning in hell. And he's satisfied. Let that one sink in for a minute. That was what it took for God to be satisfied so he could forgive you. Was to be satisfied by seeing his son's soul burning in hell. Mm. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Um, I wanna, I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 8. Next. Oh, there it is. Matthew eight seventeen. Again, remembering this is ta tagging off that line in First Peter two that he bear our sins in his own body. All right. Um, verse sixteen in Matthew chapter eight says, "When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and he healed all that were sick." That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. All right. Now, I want you to notice something here. Jesus is not on the cross at this point. But he just cast out devils and he healed many. I healed all that were sick. OK, with the spirits uh, cast out the spirits. Where did those spirits go and those devils go and those sicknesses? What did Isaiah the prophet say was fulfilled in that doing? Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. They went into his body. His body is what bore our sicknesses. It says there in his, it, who his own self bare our sins in his body on the tree. In Isaiah, we just read that, that he'd bear our infirmities. Here, Isaiah's, Isaiah is being quoted as saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses after he had healed them that were sick, cast out spirits with, the, with his word, and uh, many who were possessed with devils had them taken out. And he bore them in his body as he walked this earth. So why didn't they kill him? You got to figure, where did the leprosy go when he would heal a leper? Where did that leprosy go? Into his body. Every time that he healed somebody, when he healed Lazarus, where did that death go? Lazarus, come forth. Where did that death go? In his body. So he was walking around carrying all these diseases, carrying all this leprosy. But why didn't it kill him? Because of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Paul says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. All right. The law of sin and death is the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is that thing that allowed him to walk this earth. His spirit is life. In him is life. Okay. And so while he was walking this earth and he had his spirit in him, there was life in him. It didn't matter what sickness or what illness or what devil or what evil spirit was upon him 
He bore it in his body. And then he bore it on that tree where he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And that spirit of life in Christ Jesus was taken from his body, given to his father. He committed it to his father who would protect it and keep it. And he died. It is awesome. Isn't that something? That Jesus walking this earth carried all that sin. And it's right here in your Bible. Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Have you ever considered that before though? And yet that same spirit of life is available to us. And when we're born again, he, he quickens us in our mortal bodies. He quickens our spirits. Ephesians 2.1 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's that, that spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's that mind of Christ that he gives us. That's too much to fathom. That's too much to handle for a Thursday night Bible study. I'm telling you. I can't even take it. Let's go to uh, Leviticus 16. We'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep plowing away at this. Leviticus chapter 16. I love in my studies, anytime I find a cross reference or I'm looking up a word and there, it's used in Leviticus, I love it because I love the book of Leviticus. There's so much in here and I get, I get excited anytime I see it. Uh, Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 22. Uh, let's look at verse 20. We'll get the whole, the whole context of this here. And when he hath made an end to the, of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. He shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. Yeah, it has to be a fit man, a person fitting for that position. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Taking it out of the congregation. All the sins and all the iniquities of the people for that year were placed upon the head of that goat. And a fit man was to take it out into the wilderness, away from the people and away from the congregation. And that goat was going to wander and die. But it was outside of the camp. Jesus Christ himself bore our sins and our iniquities and all our, it, those diseases and everything that was, was put upon him there. All of that was laid upon him. And he was led by the hand of a fit man to Golgotha, where he was crucified, and where he went to a place where there's no inhabitants. He went into that bottomless pit without water. Just as Joseph, just as Joseph was betrayed by his brethren and cast into a dry well, a pit without water, Jesus Christ himself was betrayed by his brethren, by Judas Iscariot, and he died and his soul went to a pit without water. Remember that rich man is in hell right now begging for a drop of water. That's where Jesus' soul went. You see that, that picture of Jesus Christ even in the life of, of Joseph. So uh, since we're right here close, turn to Exodus chapter 28. Anytime anybody wants to comment or, or speak up about something, feel free to. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But when people get sick now, where does their sickness go? Well, we still bear it. Je Jesus, he bore those infirmities and sicknesses when he was walking on this earth, right. when he healed them and took them from him. We don't have the gifts of healing somebody anymore. I can pray for Lois, and if God figures this is good for Lois, he'll heal her. But beyond that, I have no power to heal anybody. So I can't take an illness from you. I can't heal a broken bone. I can't miraculously do those things. All right? Because that which is perfect has come. We no longer need those signs. And so our sins and our iniquities before the foundation of the earth, the lamb was slain for those. So before Jesus himself said, let there be light, 
those iniquities and those sins were already laid upon him. In his om omnipresence and his omniscience and his om om all the omnis. Just all powerful and he's everywhere. All at once and every single time. And so he bore those things. And then when he was given that body, remembering uh, uh, the psalmist said, uh, or no, it was in Hebrews, Hebrews 10. I'll, I'll, I'll read it um, just to, so we're clear on it. Uh, Hebrews 10. Um. Yeah, verse 5, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. That body was prepared for Jesus Christ, the Word. All right, that, was his, that was his, who he was before he took on flesh and became Jesus. He was the Word. All right? And so, when the Word was made flesh and dwelled among us, we beheld him, we beheld his glory as of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And when he walked on this earth in that body, he bore iniquity, he bore uh, uh, the sins on the cross and, and bore them into the grave. But he also bore those infirmities and those sicknesses in that body as he walked this earth. Now, when he takes a sickness from us, it, it doesn't go anywhere because the prophecy has been fulfilled, as far as I can see. Now, if God shows me something different than that, well, I'll be sure to let you know. If, if you're studying, you find something. Hey, you know what? I, I think he's still bearing those. Let me know. I'd, I'd love to know. So, all right, Exodus 28, verse 38. It says, and it shall, oh, uh, we're going to have to back up. All right, this is uh, speaking of that, um, uh, the fair mitre. It says right here in verse 36, And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, engrave upon it like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it upon a blue lace, that it may be put upon the mitre. Upon the forehead of the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things, which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts, and it shall be always, you notice that's always, so that's at all times, upon his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. All right, all, if you think about this, the iniquity of the holy things. What is iniquity? It's lawlessness in your heart. Well, how can holy things have iniquity? All right, these holy things are those vessels that were made, the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle itself, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, you know, all of the, the furniture for the tabernacle, all of this, all of the, the knops and the gold and everything that was on all the different things. Mm -hmm. Yes. What is a, mitre? a mitre, it would be like a, a type of a headdress. All right. Maybe like a, a headband or a, a, um, a turban. OK, if, if we put it in those kind of terms, uh, something that would be worn on the head and this holiness unto the Lord would be on the forehead of this thing. Okay, And so this is what Aaron the priest was to, to wear at all times. Because as men worked on those things, God gave them the dimensions, gave them the instructions, gave them all of that. But even in today's technology, even in to, with today's um, micrometers and like measurement instruments and all of this, there is still variances even down to the molecular level, okay? If God says to make it three cubits long, it had better be exactly three cubits long or you in disobedience to the Lord on a holy thing and you're going to be killed. But my cubit's a little different than your cubit. Their cubit might not have been exact on each thing. So there's iniquity in those holy things. And in order for those holy things to still be considered holy, Aaron had to bear that mitre on his head, holiness unto the Lord, that he would be able to bear the iniquity of those holy things. And here we have Aaron being a picture of Jesus Christ, bearing the iniquity of these holy things. As we consider ourselves holy vessels unto the Lord, we still have iniquity. We still live in lawlessness at times. Jesus Christ 
bore those iniquities. Uh, I, I, this was a very precious thing as, as I was considering this the other day. My wife is my fair mitre. Okay, I'll just explain it to you this way. As, as we consider there uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, I believe, uh, where it talks about that um, the, the woman is the glory of the man. Okay, What you are, men, is what you will reap out of your wife. Okay, If you are a, a brawler, if you are a wrathful man, if you are contentious, if you are effeminate, that's exactly what you're going to reap out of your wife because she is your glory. Right? Uh, at the same time, if you are compassionate, if you are loving, if you're understanding, if you are have long suffering and, and gentleness and meekness and goodness and faith and all of that, that's what you will reap out of your wife. And she is our glory. She is our crown. Okay? The glory of the queen is her crown. The glory of the king is his crown. And she is my glory, and I bear her about. Showing forth that she is my glory. When we go places, she brings honor to my name. I don't deserve it, not even in the least bit. But there isn't a place where we go where she doesn't bring honor to me. And to me, that is a precious thing. And the Lord kind of related this holiness to the Lord in that. She is holiness to the Lord in my eyes. And she is my glory. And so this is, this is a, a you know, it really is just for us. You know, if, if, if that can work in your life, amen, praise the Lord for it. But that's, that's something God gave me just, just for us. Uh, but to be able to say that about your wife, uh, it's, it's, it's a good work of God. And that's all it is. It's nothing in her. The only thing in her is, is wretchedness and villainy. The only goodness in her is Jesus Christ. And there's nothing but goodness in her that I see. So I see Jesus in her. All right, enough about her. Let thy words be few. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. Again, the same wording here. Well, people are turning. I'm going to take a sip of coffee. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and took unto them that look for him, or sorry, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Uh, got a cross-reference there to 1 Peter 1, 9. And I'll read that to you just as long as we've got it here. Uh, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. All right, Hebrews 10, 5. Again, we mentioned this about that body that was prepared. Um, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. Um, this is that, that earthen vessel of Christ, that one that was broken. Uh, that that uh, When that earthen vessel was broken, uh, that's why in 1 John 5, 8, it says, uh, and there are three that bear record in earth, uh, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Uh, in his earthen vessel were those three things, and that's what left his body on the cross was his spirit, the water, and the blood. And those are the three things that testify of him that show that he is, that witness, bear witness of him that show that he is the Son of God. Okay, uh, let's move on to verse 25 now in 1 Peter 2. We might actually make it through this. All right. Now it says, For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Uh, there in, in Isaiah 53 and, uh, and verse 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, Peter is, Peter is quoting Isaiah 53 through this whole thing, laying out these doctrines for us. Uh, connecting, connecting the pieces, if you will. But it says, but are now, re uh, you're a sheep going astray. Um, 
I have one, two, three, four, five, six. I have six, pla six places where astray is used that I was going to look at. But I think we're going to skip that. If anybody wants those, you can look at them later. Uh, see me afterwards. I can give them to you. Um, but just for the sake of the recording, I'll read them. Deuteronomy 22, 1 and 2. Psalm 119, 176. Isaiah 53, 6. Jeremiah 50, verse 6. Matthew 18, 12 and 13. And then here in 1 Peter 2, 25. And so, again, if you want those later, I can give them to you uh, slower and you can write them out. Um, but I want to look at this, this shepherd and bishop of your souls. Turn to Psalm 80, verse 1. Psalm 80. There's really only a few places this, this word is used, um, and only three places where it's capitalized. All right. Psalm 80 and verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. And you read all the way down through Psalm 80. I'm telling you, it is a, it is a, it's a powerful psalm. Excuse me. Powerful psalm. Uh, look at verse 19, the very last, all right? It, it said there at the beginning, uh, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. Verse 19 says, turn us again, O Lord God of hosts. Cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved. Uh, this shepherd, all right? There, like I said, there's only three places where shepherd is capitalized. And it is speaking of Jesus Christ in these places. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims. What is between the cherubims? Anybody know what's, what is it? The ark. It's the mercy seat. That mercy seat is between the cherubims. That is where Jesus Christ dwells. That's where the shepherd of Israel dwells. Is between those cherubims. And so, they're again relating it back to Jesus Christ and, and that mercy seat and uh, so much, so much. It's just a depth of riches that, that you just, you can't exhaust. The second place that uh, shepherd is capitalized is there in verse 25, under the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And then in 1 Peter 5, 4, and I'll just read that quickly. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. All right. So that shepherd is the same one as the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the entirety of the word of God. Now this word bishop. I just have a couple places here. I want to turn to 1 Timothy. This is, this is really what I've been most excited about uh, since the Lord showed me this the other day. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, bishop is only used a few times. Uh, it's used in the postscript of 2 Timothy and also... Uh, Titus, oh, I've got to get a second, first Timothy, there we go, um, and then other places, it, uh, it's used in bishop prick, let another man his bishop prick take, a bishop prick is, is a, a parcel of land, okay, a bishop uh, in, in English rule would have an area of land that they ruled over, uh, much like a, a kingdom, okay, or a uh, Oh, what's the other word I'm looking for? A principality. Okay, a prince would rule over a land. That would be a principality. A bishop prick is an area that a, a bishop rules over. All right, so let another man his bishop prick take. It's speaking of Judas Iscariot, uh, taking that office and taking the land that would have been left to him, okay, in, in, the, uh, in the resurrection. All right, but now, here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we say, it says this, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. All right, so now what we're about to see is the qualifications for the bishop of a church. The bishop of the church is, 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 is at times, the, the bishop it fills the role of a pastor, okay? I am the bishop of this church. I oversee, I conduct, I, I deal out the authority. I, this, this is my realm, so to speak, in that realm is pastoring. But what you won't find are qualifications for pastors. You find qualifications for bishops. But the Dale Morey has things in his life that negate him from being the bishop of a church. 
But he is the pastor of those men in jail. He is the carer of their souls. He, he distributes the word of God to them. He counsels them. All right? He shepherds them. That is the, that is the work of a pastor, okay? to care for their souls. And so a little clarification there. Uh, but let's look at this. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker. Not, and by the way, striker, that doesn't mean that they're hitting, you know, not somebody that hits people. A striker is somebody who strikes camp, stays a little while, and then gets up and leaves. And strike camp somewhere else, stays a little while, gets up and leaves. They're, we'd call them a vagabond, all right? They wander into town, stay for a little while, and then they move on, okay? That's not what the man of God is to be. The man of God is to be settled, okay? Not constantly looking to be moving on. That's what a striker is. Uh, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. All right. Now listen to this. Jesus Christ is the bishop of our souls. So every single qualification for the bishop of a church matches the qualifications of the bishop of your souls. So let's look at that in light of these being Jesus Christ. A bishop, the bishop of your souls, Jesus Christ, must then be blameless. And he is. Not only, it doesn't say sinless, although he is sinless. But it means, he says blameless. There is nothing that he can even take the blame for that he has done out of sorts. All right? He is just and the justifier. God the Father is. In looking at Jesus Christ, seeing that blood, and saying, that's enough. I have faith in that blood. He set forth his son to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. They may be just and uh, the justifier of them that believe on him. I think that's how that goes. I'm sorry for getting that a little off. But, but blameless. All right? So Jesus Christ must be blameless. Jesus Christ must be the husband of one wife. And he is the church. He must be vigilant. All right, so look at this. Jesus Christ is vigilant. If he is the shepherd and bishop of your souls, he is being vigilant over your soul. Okay? He is watching out for it. Do not think that anything happens on this earth without him knowing every intimate detail about it. He's watching. He's vigilant. He must be sober. All right, this not only means not a drunkard, okay, but sober-minded. He's serious. All right? He's not your buddy. He's not your pal. It's not daddy God. It's Jesus Christ, the king of the universe. And he's sober about it. Of good behavior. That's Jesus. It's just of good behavior. He can only do that which is good. I love the, the one line of that song. Um, in, in, it's Be Still My Soul. But the one line of it, we have it in our new hymnals. It says, uh, uh, be still my soul, uh, your Jesus can repay. Out of his own fullness, all he takes away. Mm -hmm. And so the inclination in that is that there are things that Jesus will take away, but he will pour it back into you, the good things of life. Mm -hmm. Okay, Not that he's going to make your life Simple, not that he's going to make your life happy and never have any problems. No, if you, honestly, when we get into the end of, of First Peter, you're going to see where suffering is a very good thing for the Christian on earth. And when suffering comes, that's a good sign. So we ought to rejoice in those things, aren't we told to? All right, of good behavior. Given to hospitality. You know what that means? Whosoever will may come. Being hospitable means that your doors are open and anybody can come in and visit. And Jesus Christ is just given to hospitality. That's just part of who he is. Apt to teach. Now, this is a precious thing for me. Because as I've been studying out there in, in 1 John 2.20, but you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. All right, that Holy One of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ, we know all things because of the unction from him. And I personally believe it's that spirit, that, that anointing on the inward parts. It is an anointing, but anointing is on the outward parts. 
this is an unction. It's on the inward parts. It's that, it's that knowledge of God, that knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it says that he is apt to teach. And so if you want to know anything out of this Bible, you don't go to a commentary. You don't go to a dictionary. Those dictionaries can help you in understanding why Jesus Christ chose that particular word. Just so make sure it's, it's one that would be applicable in that time period. You don't go to... Honestly, you have no need that any man should teach you. Why? Because Jesus Christ is to be your teacher. Because he is apt to teach. That means, it means what you're with, when you're with him, you're going to learn something. The man of God ought to be that way. The bishop ought to be that way. I strive to be that way. If I have any conversation with anybody, I try to teach. And so uh, let's continue looking at this. Not given to wine. No striker. He's settled. He's not going to wander here and there. He's settled. He abides. Okay, This is another way we can look at that. Abiding in Christ, the one who abides in the Father. Mm -hmm. All right, He abides. He's not a striker. Mm -hmm. That would be a good compare and contrast. A striker, the opposite of a striker is one who abides. Okay, Study that out. That would be a good one for you. Um, not greedy of filthy lucre. He's not in it for what he can gain out of it. He's only in it to bring glory to his Father. That is what he is here for. And that's, that's what the Holy Ghost does for Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus Christ does for the Father. Not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient. Boy, aren't we glad for that. The long-suffering of God. The long-suffering of your Jesus Christ. I mean, how long have you made him suffer? How long have you made his wounds stink? Because you've rejected and outright refuse to believe the Holy One of God. Not a brawler. All right, again, if we're to be patterning our life, remember when he was reviled, he reviled not again. Okay, when he suffered, he didn't, what was, what was the terminology there? What was the word used? Um, he threatened not. Okay, so he's not a brawler. He's gentle. That's our shepherd. But that shepherd can also be the lion and the bear and the wolf. He's on guard for those things. Mm -hmm. I rod and thy staff, they comfort me. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. And that's where it falls on us. This is his house. If you're born again, we are his children. And he is one that ruleth well his house. When he's welcomed there. And he'll rule his house well. And he'll have his children in subjection with all gravity. As you consider having your children in subjection. That would mean that they don't tell you what to do. It doesn't matter how old they are. Your children should never tell you what to do. They ought to honor you. Now when it gets to the point where your life is, is getting to that stage in life. Where there needs to be extra health care and, and help, the end of life decisions and such. But they're to be honoring you in that. And a child that tells his parents what to do is dishonoring to his parents. And according to the law of God, if they were still back in that day, would be rightfully stoned by the elders of the city. That's how God considers his children. He rules us well. And we ought to be in subjection with all gravity. But it says having his children. That means that he takes the steps to put his children under subjection with all gravity. All right? That's where the chastisement comes in. That's where that ruling comes in. It's a very precious thing. We're going to turn to Titus. We've got about a minute left. We're going to look at these couple of verses in Titus and then we'll close. Titus chapter 1. Of course, remembering, but you are a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. Titus is right after 2 Timothy. Just before Philemon in Hebrews. Okay. Titus chapter 1 verse 5 says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, 
the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Here it is again. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine. There it is again. No striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality. Here it is. This is, this is a precious one. A lover of good men. A lover of good men, not, not wicked men. A lover of good men. And this also says not a hater of good men. I've known some pastors, sadly, who did not love good men. Whether it was out of jealousy, whether it was out of contempt, whether it was out of pride, they didn't love the men that were good. And it, it was, it was uh, it's a shameful thing. It's a terrible thing. And that truly disqualifies that one from being the bishop. Lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. All right? Remembering all these are, are qualifications for a bishop. And Jesus Christ is the shepherd and bishop of your soul. Look at verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as, as it hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. That's what Jesus Christ does as he woos sinners unto himself and as he convinces them of their sin and of their wickedness, those gainsayers, he is able by sound doctrine to exhort and convince them, bring them to repentance and save them. That is Jesus Christ. That is why I say with absolute certainty that this King James Bible is the perfect word of God. That this King James Bible has a depth of riches that we have only even begun to scratch the surface of. There is so much light, just even in the, I would say, the last 20 years, that God has given to mankind as a whole in relation to this book. I, I listen to Leonard Ravenhill sometimes. Uh, sometimes I'll listen to um, Vance Havner. Uh, these old men of God, and I call them men of God. I don't agree with everything they said. But there are some things that they say about the word of God that it, it oh, makes me cringe. Then I remember there was a time of ignorance that God winked at. But now he calls all men everywhere to repent. He's not going to no longer allow people to just go on in ignorance against the word of God being perfect. Against the possibility that there is a perfect word of God. The light has been shown to us. The light has been given to us. And he continually reveals these things to us. Through this book. That's why I say that every single page bleeds the blood of Jesus Christ. He is on every single page. You'll find him there. And it's all connected. And it very well may be that your unbelief rests in that he isn't able to give you a perfect Bible in your language. That you have to have the old languages. Maybe that's where your unbelief lays. Maybe that's where I stayed in unbelief for many a year. It's a very old teaching. I tell you what, there was an old prophet. There was an old prophet that caught up with a young prophet who was told not to eat anything, not to drink anything in the land where he was in. He was just to go, deliver his message to the wicked king, and then get right back out of there. And this old prophet came along and said, I'm also a prophet of God. I hear the revelations of the Lord and and he's told me that you should come in unto my house and you should eat and you should rest and drink. And The young prophet believed the old man because he was old. Because he was a man of God and he too had a revelation and he too heard the voice of God. But he was a deceiver. And he led that prophet to his home. And in his home, as he was eating there, the prophet said, you disobeyed the Lord. On your way out of here, you're going to get mauled by a lion and die. Sure enough, that's what happened. He was killed. That young prophet was killed. He lost his life. He lost his ministry. He lost everything because he disobeyed the word of God, the light that God had given him in light of what the older man of God had said. He didn't have discernment. Didn't have discernment. He wasn't discerning of the times. Just like those people who were following Saul... But it says, the word of God says that they were discerners of the times. They could see what God was doing. They could see that God's hand had been taken off of Saul and had been placed on David. 
and they allied themselves unto David because they were discerning of the times. And that's what we must do. Believe your Bible. If it goes against something that a precious dear man of God has told you in the past, believe your Bible. We heard tonight Jesus is going to teach you. He'll show you these things. If you come up with something, you have to weigh it against the entirety of the word of God. If your theory disagrees with the word of God in one case, it's wrong. Maybe not outright entirely wrong, but you've got part of it that's wrong. Okay? So you can't just go into this thing and, and pick up some word and say, oh, this is this new doctrine. And I'm telling you what, people, people get messed up like that. My wife's family has, has family like that. Cousins. They've got, they got mixed up in some strange doctrines, and, but they don't have the word of God either. They don't use the King James Bible. They, they don't have any kind of foundation. Okay. But this is the clarity that God has given us. This is the ability that God has given us. You need not that any man should teach you. I, I say this not with any um, exuberance, not with any pride, not with any kind of boasting at all. Please understand my heart in every single matter. You all tonight in this hour have learned more than most Bible college students learn their entire four years of college. Because they're not going to learn that you can believe every word of God. They're going to have courses on Greek and Hebrew so you can actually kind of discern better what the word of God said. You're not going to hear that Jesus Christ's soul was made an offering for sin, even though the Bible says it. These things aren't going to be taught. They're going to be taught the, the Romans road ending in Romans 5 or 10, 13. And they're going to be taught you go to these doors and you say these words and you, you move the conversation in this way and you use this tactic and that tactic. Believe me, I've read the books. I've sat in the classes. I've, I've done it myself. And you can lead somebody and twist them around and get them to pray that prayer just so you can mark it in your book. This person is saved. Yet the churches don't grow. And those who are saved shirk away from you and. And they, you just can't get them to church. You don't know why. Two people on my mind right now that it was that way. And it, it breaks my heart because they've been inoculated now. They, they've been inoculated. So, but back into to 1 Peter, we'll, we'll read verse 25 again. In light of everything that we looked at, look through those qualifications for a bishop again. Um, I believe there's 27 total different qualifications for a bishop uh, in between uh, 1 Timothy, Titus, and uh, in 1 Peter here. But if you look here, it says, For ye were as sheep going astray, but now are returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. You just found out everything that a bishop is. Gave you those verses. I'll give you those verses. You can look at those shepherds and see what they do. And just how precious it is that it is Jesus Christ himself that is the shepherd and bishop of our souls. All right. That's all I have for tonight. Uh, any closing comments or, excuse me, or anything? No. Nope. All right. Uh, Sean, would you want to close us in prayer? Yes, God. And, uh, and just apply that to our lives. And, and Lord, we thank you for this time of fellowship coming up. And we pray for safety on the ride home. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.